My, my name is John Reedy. I am on the short side of 83 years old. I, 1945, I did what most, a lot of 17-year-olds did. I joined the Navy. I was separated from the Navy in 1949 in August. In 1952, July, I enlisted in the Army, went to Korea, and uh, was separated from the uh, Army in uh, 1955. When you were in Korea? No, no, I put this stuff together after. You made I came. this? No, 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 I, I ordered it, you know, <laughs> oh, put yeah. it together after I came back home. Uh -huh. Now, uh, let me explain this thing here. Well, that, that's my ship in the World War II. Mm -hmm. There are one or two there. There's, there's a couple of pages. Well, you can have them. I got more. This is the line of resistance during the, just before the end of the war. Mm -hmm. It has all of the uh, outposts on it. Now, when the war ended, it was a war of outpost activity. Yeah. And in other words, when the, when the Chinese wanted to hit the main line of resistance, which was up here somewhere, they had to come through the outpost first. So that's where all the action took place. So the, the outposts are the triangles then? Yep, those are the triangles. Now, once they overran an outpost, then they came up in what they call the main line of resistance. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was brute force. That was, a that was a major operations. Yeah. 100,000 Chinese, you know. Now, uh, How many people were stationed in the outposts? Depends on the size. Uh -huh. For instance, pork chop. Now, Chor Chorwan, where's Chorwan here? Someplace. Here's pork chop. Yeah, pork chop. We were on pork chop. Uh -huh. 17th Infantry, uh, the 7th Division. Uh, man, 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 pork chop. Mm -hmm. That was a battalion-sized outpost, out in front of the, out down in the valley. How many is make up a battalion? A battalion, three companies make a battalion, and the companies usually hundred people, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, they never, they never are at full strength. Mm -hmm. Three, three platoons of uh, twenty-five or thirty men apiece, mm -hmm. plus you know weapons and things like that. So uh, maybe a hundred and thirty, hundred and forty people in it in a company. Now, uh, the last action on Pork Shop, for instance, was in July 1953. The commanding general for the 7th Infantry Division showered, you know, those leaflets like I had in there. That <laughs> oh, yeah. They put them in artillery shells and fired them over the enemy. Showered them with uh, leaflets Claiming, Same, please surrender. No, no, not please surrender. No, no, it's just the opposite. To, to celebrate our country's birthday on July the 4th, uh -huh. they were going to attack a hill on the other side. Now, in that hill was a, Asians love to dig tunnels. Yeah. You understand yeah, that? I've heard about those, yeah. And uh, so they had a, had a tunnel. They had tunnels all along, but in that one tunnel, they had a field piece, artillery. And every now and then they would drag that field piece out and bang away four or five rounds, you know, and drag it back in before they could register our defensive artillery on it. It was harassment, mainly. So the commanding general t showered them with leaflets telling them that to celebrate our country's birthday, the 4th of July, they were going to take that hill with that <laughs> field piece in it. And, but before they could do that, they had to take the field piece. They, take the tunnel. So they sent Charlie Company down. That's a company of infantry. It had sneaks on them and everything like that. You know, it had all kinds of different uh, sophistication mm -hmm. to, to make them feel. Sneaks don't make any bit of difference, you know. And uh, so they went down and they hit the, uh, hit the mouth of that tunnel. And when they did, they didn't drag out the a field piece. What they did was drag out a regiment of Chinese soldiers. And they had no idea they were there. No, they didn't notice. They, you know, they kind of simple, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Figured this is what we'll do. They're going to do what we want them to. Uh -huh. So uh, they overran that company of infantry, 
and overran the battalion on pork chop, but they didn't push them off. So they fought on pork chop for about uh, better than a week. They, they had to pull the, they, they um, relieved the battalion that was on there. And pretty soon our whole regiment had been cycled over that hill. Then they had to, they brought in another regiment to, re to relieve the 17th. And uh, eventually, of course, they couldn't. And the interesting thing about it was the 17th Regiment alone decimated over a division of Chinese regular soldiers, just by the fighting. But they, their fighting was different than ours. Was it more a guerrilla warfare type? No, it's the, we were more organized. Mm. For instance, they would shell the hill. And they had, would have their infantry come in right through the shelling, just walk right through the shelling. And we, you know, we didn't do things like that. We, we were defensive. We'd be in bunkers and, and yeah. trenches and things like that. We didn't come right out in the open yeah. until we had to. You don't want to expose yourself. That's right. That's right. You want to take care of yourself. You, you know, you don't want to, hey, casualties are <laughs> no, Unde good. undesirable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so eventually, both sides give up the hill. And nobody knew why the Chinese wanted it, because, you know, it was in July. The, the peace talks were coming along fine. Well, not fine, but you know. They're, they're, they're moving, they're progressing. They're, they're, that's right, that's right. They were, but, uh, so here's an interesting thing. One of the big arguments uh, over, the, over the peace talks in Pam and John was that uh, the Chinese wanted repatriation mm -hmm. back to the original uh, company, the country. For instance, they wanted all the Chinese soldiers back from the POWs. Well, we said, we don't want to do that. We, you know, if the POWs want to go back to China, we'll send them back. But if they, don't, if they want to go anywhere oh, so else... So the Chinese government wanted to force the soldiers to go back to China. That's right. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and I don't know whether they wanted to go back or not. Yeah. You know, I have no idea, because, you know, that's politics. Yeah. And uh, uh, the... Uh, the United Nations said, we'll send them anywhere they want to go as long as they can find a host company, a country that'll take them. Well, fighting, fighting. See, the Chinese said no. They demanded all the people back. So I have no idea why would they would have an international squabble like that. Well, Syngman Rhee was the president of South Korea at the time. Mm -hmm. He got sick of it. So in June, he opened up the POW camps. Just open the gates and let them all go. out. Let them all out. Go where you want to go. You don't have to. Well, the ones that wanted us didn't want to go back to China. They stayed in the camps. They didn't leave. So they said it was better to be in a POW camp yeah, than to well, go back to China. Yeah. Well, see, they wouldn't. Have, they would do to go anywhere. It's yeah. better to go anywhere, go anywhere than go back to China. But huh. if they stayed there. They would be uh, emigrated to somewhere else, see? Mm -hmm. Maybe South Korea, who knows? But uh, maybe a lot of them maybe wanted to go to Taiwan. Well, about 20,000 of them wanted to go back to China. So here they are loose now in our rear. And things started happening. For instance, the uh, reverse slopes, you know, Companies that are, uh, troops that are on the line, well, they, their headquarters are right in the rear area, right behind the main line of resistance. You understand the MLR, main line of resistance? Well, their, their headquarters and their billets and everything are right behind the line, maybe a mile or so back of the line. Division was maybe two or three miles back of the line, see, the division headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, the regimental headquarters, I, I, we were about a, a little over a mile back on the reverse slope. You understand the reverse slope? Behind the... The, the slope, it, this is a hill. Um, 
Okay. This is the forward slope. It points towards the line of resistance. There are hills. Mm -hmm. This is the reverse slope. Now it's very difficult to drop an artillery round into the reverse slope. Understand? You can hit the forward slope easy because, you know, <laughs> but you can't drop it over the hill and into the reverse slope. Well, all of a sudden, the people back at division and the people back at regimental headquarters and, you know, reverse slopes, they started getting rounds in. And that's impossible. See, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible. You can't. So someone hard. is firing. Someone, is, someone firing. is calling in the rounds. Huh. So they went back to uh, searching, went searching for them, and they had a Korean start monitoring the radio waves. Mm -hmm. And he picked up someone giving a coordinates, map coordinates over the radio. So they, they got the uh, uh, radio direction people to find out where these waves were originating. They, these guys that, uh, some of these 20,000 people that were in our rear had made it into the motor pool, got into a couple of spare radio trucks, turned up the radio and they were calling the rounds in. <laughs> really? Calling the rounds in. So, so you said 20,000? 20, 20,000. They, they figure 20,000 were wandering around in the hills. That's a lot of POWs. In South that. Korea. Well, they, they took a lot of prisoners. Yeah. Lot of, and where do you think the others went? They stayed oh, in Korea? Oh, I had no idea. That's not my department to figure that out. <laughs> Did you get a chance to meet any Chinese at all? Or, no. I mean, besides no, fighting no, them, no. you know? I didn't meet any civilians whatsoever. Oh, really? Now, I, uh, I enlisted in 1952. Mm -hmm. I was, I already done four years in the Navy. I didn't have to go. I was regular Navy. I was not subject to the draft or reserve recall or anything like that. My obligation was complete. Mm -hmm. But, so when the war started, I got out of, I got out of the Navy in August of 1949. Uh, when the war started, it was June 1950. It's just a short time and I was still military oriented. Mm -hmm. But I said, should I go? You know, should I go sign up and help? But it appeared, by the, while I was making up my mind, it appeared that the United Nations troops are gonna be pushed right off the Penin Pusan Peninsula, you know, right out into the sea. And I figured, well, by the time I got trained and got over there, be over. Yes, and, I, and I, then I would be stuck for an enlistment, see. Uh -huh. So then I decided, uh, to wait a while. Well, then MacArthur went to Incheon, and it looked like that was going to end it all. So, so then I said, well, what's the sense of going now because it's all over? But then the Chinese came in, and then, uh, then they started going back and forth down the Sewell, you know. Then. So I said, well, it's time for me to go now. Then I'm going to go in the war. So here's, I figured like this. I would go over there get trained, you know, so in, in, uh, I, I enlisted in the Army in July, July the 22nd, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey to radio, uh, to uh, basic training, and then to, uh, and then radio school, now, and I became a communication specialist. And they sent me to Korea. I knew I was going to go to Korea, you know, there's, there's no yeah. doubt. FECOM, Far East Command. <laughs> like, I wonder where that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I got there in the winter time, and I figured, I'm here now, the world ended. And sure enough, six months later it ended. I'm, I must have done something right. <laughs> it's all you. I, I heard John Reedy was coming. Yeah. But uh, I... Uh, and they had a point system, too. The point system said that uh, if you could earn 36 points, you could go home. Now, to get 36 points, you had to be in a line company. I was back a regiment, so I was in a three-point zone. And then back the division was two points, and everything else was one point. Now, when you got down past the 36-point zone, then you needed 40 points. But and it had a complicated system of uh, computing your points. 
if you, for instance, if you were in a three-point zone and you went up on the line for a certain amount of time, they gave you that benefit <laughs> of those points. And it did the same thing with the combat pay. Now, if you were in a four-point zone, you got combat pay for the whole month. If you were in a three-point zone, you got, you know, your... Uh, um, combat pay. Your, well, your combat pay, you got that portion of your combat pay. So, so... So did you volunteer to go to the line then, because you wanted... Yeah, but, but you know, sometimes you could volunteer and not go. It wouldn't take you up there. Uh -huh. You know, it, it all depends on whether you're needed or not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, mm -hmm. so I went when the, when the, when the ceasefire start came in J July the 20, 23rd, 27th, I think it was. I went back to personnel to find out how I stood. And they said to me, well, Corporal, you don't have to worry about it, because you're regular army. That means I had a three-year hitch, you see, and I still had a year and a half to do. And I said, what's that got to do with it? I said, the points. He said, the points don't enter into it as far as you're concerned. We got all of these two-year draftees we have to send home. <laughs> so, you, so you had no chance of going home then? No chance. <laughs> so I said to him, well, how about sending me to Australia? And he said, well, Australia, you need 36 months obligated potential, and you only got 18. So you're staying put. Yeah. He said, if, if you want to uh, extend for that other 18 months, we'll send you to Australia. Yes. I said, well, if you can send me to Australia, why can't you send me back to the States? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but it came sooner than I thought, you know, maybe four or five months later. Mm -hmm. They sent me back to, uh, and back to Fort Benning, Georgia. And I just as soon have been left in Korea, I tell you. If you haven't spent the summer at Fort Benning, Georgia. It's hot. Oh, terrible, terrible. At least you're not fighting. Yeah. Well, I wasn't fighting anyway. The hostilities had ceased. Yeah. So. So when you got over there, basically, it was, the treaty was already in the process. Of well, they were talking. They were yeah. talking. They, 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 uh. They negotiated for two years. But the harshest battles, weren't the harshest no, battles no, kind of no, towards no, the end? No, no. They, were, they kept pushing. You see, the communist forces did not negotiate under, uh, uh, under a time of weakness. Mm -hmm. you, if you're, they believe if you're in a weak position, you can't, uh, you can't negotiate. Mm -hmm. You only can negotiate when you can back off and you, you know, make concessions. No, no, no. They, they, uh, they were attacking, and the, the worst part about it was, they were pushing all the time. Every one of those, uh, every one of these outposts mm -hmm. was contested every single day. Yeah. And and you said you were about a mile behind those we were, outposts. Yeah, yeah. My headquarters is about a mile behind the outposts. So what was it? What was it like when you were stationed? I mean, was it kind of scary seeing uh, people? Oh, what, what was like your personal experience like? Oh, well, well, I I worked the switchboard uh -huh. <laughs> because of the communications, and uh, I worked a night shift because mm -hmm. I didn't want to work shift work. I'd always work shift work. I didn't like shift work, but during the day, <clears throat> I would go out with the wire teams and stuff like that. See, so I keep myself busy, mm -hmm. and uh, it was boring, boring, very boring. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, so you didn't see any action? That's right, that's right. Yeah. You'd see these people going up out the hills. Now, <clears throat> the service, the Army, operates on a triangle-type table of organ organization and equipment. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, Army has up to three corps in it. Each corps might have a number of divisions in it. <clears throat> Each division has three regiments. Each regiment has three companies plus a heavy weapons company. And, you know, each company has three platoons plus a heavy weapons platoon. So that's the way it worked. And when they relieved them on the, out on the uh, outpost, one regiment would take control of the uh, MLR. That would be their uh, place of business. They didn't, uh, mm -hmm. they didn't uh, rotate with other regiments there. When they rotated with regiments, they moved the whole regiment and replaced them. But out on the, uh, <clears throat> on the hill, 
there's three battalions. One battalion will be out on a hill, one battalion will be up on the main line of resistance and blocking position, and the other battalion would be back in reserve. See, taking care of their equipment, things like that. And then every month they would rotate them. And they had their problems back in the uh, medical problems. We used to wash our clothes whenever we got a chance. Now, if you're out on the, on the hill, you don't get a chance to wash your clothes. You don't waste water. You wash your clothes in your you helmet, but you don't waste water. Sure. The water comes up into the bunker in mm -hmm. five-gallon cans. And uh, the, the, bunk, the trench warfare is almost like, uh, you know, this neighborhood down the street. Mm -hmm. People lived in bunkers had regular trash pickups, you know, they had dragged the trash, had to be fed, you know, sleep routines and things like that. So, for instance, uh, when, you, when you want a hot meal, they, they try to get a, one hot meal a day, I tell you, no matter when Those it would sea be. sea rations, you'd, you'd fire up, that's what you brought. Well, yeah, if you wanted hot sea rations, yeah, okay. But, you know, you didn't always make make that hot meal, see, because of the duties, you understand? Things you have to do. But the bigger, the bigger uh, uh, hills, the bigger outposts, on the reverse slope from the enemy, they had child bunkers. Now, you understand what I mean by bunker? Mm -hmm. Big timbers, uh, stone and rocks on top of them, right. uh, and each one was connected by a trench. And uh, you go back to the child, if you could make it, you get back to the child bunker and you get fed. So did your, did your camp ever receive artillery fire while you were? Oh yes, oh yeah, all the time. Yeah. Uh, air burst, like? air burst. What was that like? Well, you go to bed, you go to bed and you sleep in a tent. Yeah. You come out in, in, in the morning, you know, after, or wherever you've been, and you find a, a fuse off the nose of an artillery shell laying there. So you know how close you came. But did it, did it, were there any, ever attacks where you know you're running for your life or people were getting hit or no, anything no, like that? No, 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 none of that, none of that. Mm -hmm. it's, but when uh, after the they started fighting on pork chop, everybody was scared. Mm -hmm. Now I used to, in my spare time, for instance, I would ride shotgun on the message center jeep, the regimental message center. That's where all of the communications everything came in, and I had one break <coughs> for about two weeks where the commanding officer had a lieutenant uh, communications officer. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know how to run this little loaf of bread, we called it, M222, three What's twos, that? converter. It, uh, the radio converter? No, it was for message, uh, code, oh, oh, code. Okay. It's one of those things with the wheels on it, see? Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you have to know what the uh, <clears throat> day's code was. You, you put those under the wheels, and then the, the, the words would come in in five-letter groups. It might take 15, 8, 12, 13 letters to make a word. Mm -hmm. So you had to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you, and so you, you, you adjust the wheels before you start the message. Then you, using the wheels, you put the letters in where they belong, and uh, would, tape would come out the other end, and then you'd have to piece it together, you know, you have to figure out what the messages were. Well, his lieutenant didn't know how to use that. So... So you had to teach him? Yeah, I had to teach him. <laughs> Two weeks, eat the message, the officer's mess, you know, and yeah. <laughs> go to the officer's club. <laughs> That's great. I enjoyed it. <laughs> So what, I, what was it like interacting with all the soldiers? Responsibilities, yeah. you know, like what was that like interacting? With any well, stories they, or experiences? Yeah, I was regular army. The most of them were draftees. Mm -hmm. There's a little conflict there. So they resented me in, enlisting voluntarily. Why, why would they resent you? <laughs> well, because they were called from their bed and board, mm -hmm. and I come in deliberately. Uh, well, one one way we, uh, my friends and I. Uh, broke up the monotony. We would go to the motor pool and steal a Jeep. Now you look at that, see how far away from, we are from anyone. 
Fort Chapel, way up there. Mm -hmm. I never saw any civilians. I saw the Katusas and the KSCs, but never any other civilians. What was, yeah. Uh, tell me about the Katusas and the KSCs. Katusas were Korean Army attached to the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, in order to satisfy Congress and the Geneva Convention, we had to have Korean nationals uh, fighting. With that's right. The that's Iran. right. Just just a minimum of them, but they had to be uh, attached to each each outfit. So what was that like working with them? And good, good, them? good. They yeah. they they were interesting. I tried to talk to them. They tried to talk to me. You know. How yeah. how did that work out? Oh well, you get to know the pigeon English. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, so they did you, did you, were you guys able to share experiences or learn about each other, uh, and cultures at all? Not too much mm -hmm. because we couldn't understand each other that yeah. well. Yeah. But they were buddies. They were buddies. For instance, we played blackjack, and the the Katusas, they didn't make much money. But if I had the deal, you ever play blackjack? Of course, yeah. Okay. If I had the deal, I got my buddy said, "Get in," and I give him a free ride, girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so you guys got to kill time with each other. You oh yeah, other. yeah, yeah. Well, we would go to my buddies and I would go to the motor pool and steal yeah. the jeep. Yeah. And head towards Wee Jam Boo. Uh huh. Drive right? around the countryside. Yeah, we never made it. <laughs> it's very dangerous. Yeah. First, you got these guys in June wandering around in the hills, but uh, the army every two or three miles. Mm -hmm. on their highways, they put up a checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And you got to figure out ways to break these checkpoints. So while you're going down the road, you keep track of the outfits that you're going by. They all have a little signpost identifying themselves. You come to the checkpoint, if they wouldn't let you through, then you'd say, we're looking for the 23rd Mesquite repair, you know where it is? And they say, Oh yeah, back there about a mile. Oh, we missed it. Turn around and go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take the jeep back. <laughs> Never made it to Wee Jambo. <laughs> so, well, what were your what were your impressions of Korea when you first got there? I guess uh, you know the land side. You didn't. You said you didn't meet any civilians, but the people and just uh, when we got there, we got off the ship mm -hmm. and got on a train. Have you ever been down south? I mean, the old uh, Jim Crow railroad cars. Mm -hmm. You ever see them? Uh, I mean, the big box cars. Well, not much better. Yeah. Not much better. Uh, convert, uh, con, uh, you know, seats, uh, contoured seats, mm -hmm. and not very comfortable. And narrow gauge railroad, very narrow gauge railroad. In fact, first thing I noticed about Korea, everything was so small. <laughs> the only thing that was large were the oxen. I mean, they were big. They had a lot of grass to eat. Well, I don't know about why, but even the horses were small, you know. The, yeah. And uh, why do you think that was? Because there just wasn't anything. I have no idea. It, it, it just, no, it's just that the people were diminutive. Diminutive, you know. Mm -hmm. For instance, I noticed it in Japan. <clears throat> I said to my buddy, I says, "Look at these people. They ruled half of the world. Mm -hmm. How did they do it? The little tiny things, <laughs> you know." <laughs> Intelligence, I guess. Uh, dedication. So, so it seemed like everything, you know, it was kind of a poor uh, society. Primi then. No, not poor. Primitive. 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 No technology or. You ever see an A-frame? An A-frame. Yeah. It's made out of tree lumber. Yeah. So, so with a with a. They don't know how to explain it. But what was it for? For their houses? No, for carrying things. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. Carrying things. Uh -huh. And they could pile stuff on that. Yeah. Cane, you know, they made a lot of cane. Pile it on there. We were going down the road in a Jeep one day, and I said to the driver, I said, look out, there's a tree in the middle of the road there. And he said, okay. So we went over a hill. There's an old farmer going, he got two sticks. Yeah. Going down the road with that A-frame on his back, loaded with crane, with I uh, maybe sugar cane, I don't know just uh -huh. what it was. And it was constructed so that he could take it off and it would stand there. See? Okay. And I was sent in uh, a forward party to uh, open up a new, ar a new uh, we were moving to a new, a new uh, location. 
and uh, we're up on a hill setting up the radio truck, way up on top of a hill, and down below was the old uh, garrison. And the way they moved, <clears throat> it would send people down, uh, you know, sergeants or whoever was in charge of things, to in inspect what we were tr going to be trading. Now, if a tent was no good, then the sergeant would reject it, and they would take it down and send it back. You, you slept in squad tents, 10, 12 people. So they had rejected one tent, and the tents were on wooden platforms. So the sergeant says to me, because there was some indige indigenous, what do you call them, <laughs> Koreans down there. Local. Yeah, locals down there. He says, go up and go on down and see what the guys are doing down there. So I went down with the Jeep, you know, okay. and uh, they were cutting up one of these t tent floors. Big mammoth thing, big mammoth thing. I don't know, maybe 20 by 12, lumber. <laughs> and when I got down there, they had a half of that on this A-frame. <laughs> and the guy's choking along, you know, with this. So you're, like, you're thinking to yourself, <laughs> how are you guys doing this? <laughs> I said, so I, started, I tried to talk to the people that were left. See, they were picking up the other one, <laughs> the other half. <laughs> well, you know, if you're... The, the local, and I'm the GI, you're not going to understand a thing I'm saying, yeah. eh? but you're going to keep on working, see? Yeah. So I said, back, back, back up to the up top of the hill, and the sergeant says, well, what did you find out, really? I said, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Can't communicate. After the hostilities, we were allowed to hire civilians as houseboys and things like that, see? And they were thankful for the employment but they were more thankful for the pilferage. <laughs> mm -hmm. They would send them, we, we couldn't uh, wash our own clothes anymore, see, because of uh, what they call hemorrhagic fever. Did you ever hear of hemorrhagic fever? Well, we were washing our clothes by the, by the creeks, you know, wherever we get near a creek or a stream or something, and laying them on the, on the ground yeah. to dry, and they were picking up mites from the robots, uh, ro rodents running around. And the mites would contaminate your blood, mm -hmm. cause it to boil. And it took them a while to figure out what it was. It would kill you. Finally, they figured out that the blood's overheating, and the only way they could cure it was to pack the body in ice. Huh. And, you know, take it out periodically, put it back in. Finally, they would lower the blood temperature, and it would kill the mites. Mm -hmm. And they f figured out that we were doing it by these... Because of the washing the clothes. Washing the clothes, so we couldn't wash our clothes anymore. So we had to go back to the shower point, which was maybe 10 or 15 miles back. And when you went into the shower point, they took everything you had except your weapons, your boots, and your helmet. Burned and, it. Yeah, and then when you come out of the shower, they give you all clean, uh -huh. see? And you were allowed to finally accumul accumulate two Outfits of everything. Mm -hmm. Now the poor guys that went up on the hill, they were there for 30 days. They couldn't, couldn't wash their clothes or anything. Mm -hmm. So whenever you, and, you know, when you came back, whenever you got back to, the, for instance, if you had to leave the hill to come back to the company for something or other, you made sure you went to the shower point while you were there. So uh, finally, they, after, at the cessation of the hostilities, they allowed the uh, women to set up shower facilities, or not shower, the laundry facilities by the streams. But they had to impregnate the clothes with some kind of chemical. So the mites wouldn't... So that would retard the mites. Mm -hmm. So, but, and they had an outbreak of the hemorrhagic fever here in the United States down at the Four Corners, Utah, was Arizona, New Mexico. Wyoming. Yeah. Come to bear, yeah, and around. and they discovered that they were caused by the rats running around down there. Huh. I wondered why they were so interested mm -hmm. in what we were going to do. What we were, we were going to do for them, they had to do for themselves. And I realized later on in uh, in my studies that uh, they had been dominated since 1985 by the Japanese. I mean, we had turned our back on them and let the Japanese take over. And they were enslaved. 
They were enslaved. You didn't do anything unless the Japanese gave you permission to do it. So in, in 1945, <coughs> when we occupied the south of, south of uh, Korea, we introduced to them free enterprise. <coughs> free enterprise, uh, democracy, uh, liberty, freedom, the whole, the whole business. They did not understand it. Mm -hmm. They had no idea what it was. A new concept. That's right. They had been dominated for so long. But in five years' time, which is not very much time at all, they had began to recognize what we were doing for them and what they were doing for themselves. Because I wondered why they would uh, come out and fight like they did to preserve that. They didn't want to lose it. And look where they are now. What are they, 10th, 10th, 11th, 10th, largest industrial com country? Yeah, they went through all of the uh, hazards of democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, sand in the cement <laughs> when they build a, build a skyscraper. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, prosecution for doing it. Yeah. And there probably weren't many buildings when you were there. Oh, nothing, nothing. Yeah. Well, I didn't see anything. Yeah. I got on a train in Pusan, yeah. went up past Yong Dong Po. Now, the reason I remember Yong Dong Po because it's such a funny name. I don't know if that's an airport or a town or what it is. And uh, went through Seoul, didn't see anything. And when I was there, all the, ho all the houses, the hooches, you recognize the name, recognize the name hooch? Mm -hmm. All looked, looked like this, thatch roofs and stuff yeah. like that, see? And uh, so now yeah. I was number 85 on a list to go back. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to a guy that had gone back. He said, no more rice paddies, <laughs> all super highways. You want to eat, you can go to Arby's. <laughs> so you haven't been back yet? No, I'm not going to go back yet. Go I can go to Arby's here, right? Why should I go to Korea and sure. go to Arby's <laughs> yeah. or McDonald's? So you've talked to people who have been back and they say there's buildings yeah. everywhere? Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. they take good care of them. Yeah. The Korean War Veterans Association of Korea uh, own some hotels and things like that, see? And they uh, put, up, put them up, they feed them. You know, it's all free. All you have to do is pay the pay to get there and back. Ah, oh, you know, here's the guy. So, what do you think about um, what do you think about the fact that Korea is much more developed? And oh, it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Now, when I was in the Navy, 1949, I served aboard the uh, destroyer Hyman. We were dispatched from the Sixth Fleet to the port of Haifa, which was then Palestine, to assist the United Nations in support because they were trying to broker the peace between the Israelis and the Arabs. And I was there for about six weeks. And I say to myself, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I was instrumental, uh, one of about a thousand enlisted men in uh, assisting in the emergence of the democratic, freedom-loving nation of Israel. Well, I also was instrumental in a much larger scale in the emergence of the democratic, freedom-loving uh, the country of South Korea, yeah. the Republic of South Korea. There's only one problem. What's that? Both countries are still in, at somebody's throats. That's right. Now I wonder, I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think of the reunification of North and South Korea? What's your figure, what's your well, picture my, on it? I guess my impression is that many Koreans hope there is a reunification one day, but it almost seems like there's this doubt yeah. Uh, lingering among everyone, if All it's right. actually possible. Now, if it happens, what do you? What's your? What's your fix on it? If it happens. If it happens. Yes. What do you think? I think it'll potentially end a lot of conflict in the area. You think so? What do you think? Well, you're going to have to accept northern philosophies mm -hmm. down into the south, and I don't think that's going to 
That's, well, that's not what do you mean work. by northern philosophy? Well, they will, the politicians from their provinces will have to be accepted into north-south configuration. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's going to work? It's complicated. Complicated. Yeah. When we were down at the uh, Korean church on East Genesee Street, mm -hmm. I asked them, I said, what kind of flag are you going to have? Because they got the north flag and they got the south flag. And he said, well, uh, this guy said, well, we're going to have to uh, negotiate that. And I says, how? He says, by debate. I said, the people in the de north do not debate well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think it'll be possible then one day that the peninsula is uh, unified? If you go to the north now, they tell you, when we go back, they tell you, don't look them in the eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go someplace where I can't look a foreign soldier in the eyes. The well, maybe that, that's one of the problems and the cultural differences that yeah. people need to learn about. And, and yeah. The, the thing that burned me the most was during the ceasefire talks, when they finally got down to the, the nitty gritty, the United Nations personnel that were tra taking, driving their jeeps up, anybody, anybody that went to the negotiations had to do so under a yellow flag. What does that symbolize? Well, that, symbol, some, that, some, some, that symbolized that they were in the negotiating party. But you don't hang a yellow flag on a United States serviceman. Uh -huh. Oh, burn my ass. Terrible. <laughs> terrible. Oh, I didn't like it. Uh -huh. See those jeeps going by with the yellow flags uh -huh. and the trucks. So maybe your, your thought is that it won't. Uh, I don't know if it will or not. Yeah. For instance, uh, the two national philosophies are uh, completely different. Mm -hmm. Completely different. Now, you ever watch the History Channel? Of course. You ever see the satellite view of the peninsula? Yeah. At night? You know the what I'm talking about. The lights are in the south and there's All the lights are maybe three or four in the north. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you think, you know, the United States government's relation towards South Korea plays a role in this, you think? Oh, in the negotiations? In the negotiations or just, you know, in the... Well, right now they are, what is it, a six-point uh, treaty. Mm -hmm. Six-party talks? The two, two Koreans, Chinese, American, and, well, Russia, mm -hmm. five-point. And they, they aren't getting anywhere. Nobody's getting anywhere. So what are we going to do? Yeah, can't let it go like that. You know what I, I hate to uh, revert to the Chinese adage that uh, in, in time this too shall pass. Uh -huh. But uh, I hope it passes before China owns the United States and then Korea. We owe them a lot of money too. <laughs> yeah, that definitely plays a role in it, huh? Yeah, China and North Korea don't get along that well. From what I read, mm -hmm. we get along good with South Korea. We get along good with South Korea. We, we have treaties. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, we, a few years ago, I was at a dinner with the uh, mayor of Seoul. He was here at the Syracuse University. And we had a, down near Sam's, there's a restaurant down next to Sam's. And we had, uh, and I was sat next to the interpreter. And we were batting back and forth. And I says, what about these uh, tunnels that the North Koreans are digging down in the South Korea? He says, well, we know about them. I said, what do you do? She board them up. I said, what do you do that for? Why don't you just keep them open so in case you have to use them? He says, oh, we have our own tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> that no one knows about. <laughs> That's funny. So your life back in America. I came back to the United States. I served the year, my final year in the Army in uh, uh, Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. I was uh, interviewed to go into a Special Forces because I was a career soldier, mm -hmm. seven years. And uh, at that time, President, Roosevelt, uh, President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, was sending advisors into Vietnam. 
Now, I was watching that very closely. General de Gaulle begged the United States to assist them in, in, Viet, in uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. and we refused. Now, here we are sending advisors into Vietnam, and they were getting killed. There was dribble, just a dribble of advisors. And, uh, and you know what happened in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I, I read That's that true. correctly. Yeah. And I said to myself, I got uh, 16 years to go, mm -hmm. no, 13 years to go, and I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'll get killed in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I made it through Korea. I'm not going to go. So, so what did you do then when you decided I, not well, to? Well, I came home. I came yeah. home, and uh, there was a recession. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got mm -hmm. married, got myself a, borg a mortgage, and my wife gave me four great children. They gave me ten grandchildren, and uh, I got four grand great grandchildren now. That's great. And uh, <coughs> so, what was the impact that the war had on your life then? You know, I, you, uh, clearly you were in the military for it, a really long time. Seven years. Seven yeah. years. It, it matured me. It matured me. Yeah. For instance, um, before I went in the military, I was minimally educated. I was born in 1928, the Depression, and I left home as soon as they started drafting people. That opened up the employment picture because all the entry-level positions were not being filled. Mm -hmm. Then, so when I was 12 years old, I started. This one here, really a dirty deal. <laughs> What's this? Taft? The Taft cuts, sir. That's when the United States and Japan sold out the Philippines and the Korean Peninsula. So this is when the United States went to the Philippines then, when, they, when we invaded went the to Philippines? The, no, no, this is no. in uh, 1905. Oh, this is a perfect one. All right, well, we'll go through this. Yeah. Ah, that's it. Now, you the, you the historian. You know, I, I, I'm not, but I love history. Oh, that's my ship. <laughs> this isn't much. We have another man that has a much better chart. I'll, 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 I'll speak to him and have him bring it uh, when, when, he, uh, when you interview him. Mm -hmm. So this is a map of the whole peninsula? The whole peninsula. And you had this when you were in Korea? No, no, I put this stuff together after. You made this? No, no, no. I, I ordered it, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. put it together after I came back home. Uh -huh. Now, uh, let me explain this in here. Well, that, that's my ship in the World War II. Uh -huh. There are one or two there. There's, there's a couple of pages. Well, you can have them. I got more. This is the line of resistance just before the end of the war. I, I worked a lot of entry-level jobs, and then finally, we, we go on. Are we rolling? Yeah. yeah okay. Finally, I managed a job in the, which is the primary ingredient in glass. You can't make glass without soda ash because you have to melt the sand, and it takes too much heat there. So. And uh, so, I get, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say, so you, so you mentioned it, it matured you. Yeah, so the, the service, of course, I went in when I was 17. I come out when I was 25. Mm -hmm. So it matured me, and yeah. I learned a lot. What, so I'm wondering what kind of perspectives you, know, you, you learned. What, what actually did you learn from the war? How did it reflect on your life? I'll tell you, in the later years, I recognized the futility of it. Of what? War. Uh -huh. It does not solve anything. All it does is cost money and it costs the young men. Mm -hmm. uh, you've heard the saying that the, the old men send a young man off to, to die. Yeah. And that's it. And they refuse to recognize their efforts when they come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's especially true with. The Korean War veterans, people didn't even want to acknowledge that it was oh, a war. Oh, I came home, they didn't, they said, where, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. 
Yeah. I said, I was going to the Army for three years. I went to Korea. He said, really? Didn't know that. How does how is that? What's that? Yeah, like? that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, at least now it's clearly recognized as a war, and I think and people in our generations are... We, we left 8,177 people there, unaccounted for. If it were not for the Vietnam veterans, because they were involved for so many years with their, their 2,500 uh, MIA POWs, we would not, us Korean War veterans would not even have known about it. Yeah. They brought that to the com country's attention, and we started looking at that too then. And they're still over there, and people say, well, don't worry about it, they're all dead. Well, I don't know they're dead. Yeah. Show me the bones, show me the dog tags. Mm -hmm. Then I'll believe they're dead. Yeah. But otherwise, keep on looking for them. Yeah. He could have been one. I could have been one. In a few years, you could have been one. You know, when you get into your 50s, you could have been one of those guys. Every place I go, I see these old guys. I say to myself, that could have been a POW. Yeah. Am I it? So that's important to... Yes, it is. Oh, I could have been one, see? Yeah. I, you know, you don't turn your back on these people. Right. And uh, when they decide to send us a set of bones, they charge us about twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for them. Who, who charges the well, the, uh, government? The Koreans. Now, and it, have to, it has to be a diplomatic conception, mm -hmm. a convenience, for us to send people over there to look for the bones. Yeah. If, if, they, if, they want, uh, if they want to let us send our team over there, well, we got to come up with something. That clearly frustrates you then. Yes, yes. See, we, don't, we have a different concept of death and uh, you know, and the uh, memory of things like that than the, than the Oriental soul. You understand what I mean? Probably not. Well, I mean, there's clearly a difference in culture. Yeah, I it's think, a cultural I mean, difference. I think both cultures cultural value difference. death. It's just that maybe it's just a... S yes. For instance, uh, some Oriental cultures believe it's a benefit to go to their ancestors. Mm -hmm. We don't. Yeah. <laughs> no benefit to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 83 years old. If there was a benefit to it, I'd have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> I'd have collected that benefit. Yeah. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. They have a different concept of mortality. Okay, the, today's veterans are both patriotic and economic. Some people join the military for the career for patriotism. Others join the military because they need a job. Mm -hmm. uh, the job picture is very bleak. Now, there's no, more, there's no more draft. You have to register. Did you have to register for the youth citizen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. You register for the draft? Yeah, yeah, you get to register for the draft. Now, when it hits the fan, they may call you. You may have to go. What do you think of that? I don't like the idea of me having to, would you carry to fight, a, but if I have you, to do it. Would you carry a sign down in front of the federal building saying, hell no, I ain't go, I, I won't go? Know. Well, see, that's most, most, most of the guys your age probably would. Uh -huh. They have lost that sense of stability yeah. that this country needs. Yeah. Now, the, now the military is an all-volunteer military. Right. It's made up of National Guard, reserve and regular forces. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they all volunteer because you have to volunteer for the re reserves and the, and the National Guard. See? But don't think they won't supplement yeah. those forces with the draft that they have to. And I look at the uh, reserves and the, and the National Guard as the backyard, backdoor draft. If the worst comes to worst, they won't draft you into the military. What they'll do is draft you into the, these other two uh, functions and then, and then deploy you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to go anyway, no matter what you do. <laughs> so in your opinion then, war is not the answer? No, not at all. You know what the answer is? Young people like you mm -hmm. and the people that are in grade schools now, they have to be educated to become functional. And we have made all the mistakes. Mm 
and they, none of them worked. None of them worked. None of the things we did worked. But we have made some progress. We made some progress, but evidently none of it worked. You have people that uh, deal with, like the, you have people like George Bush and Saddam Hussein. And I don't understand either one of them, you know? They didn't, neither one of them accomplished anything. Now you got Gaddafi <laughs> and that stuff. And uh, nothing. Look at what's happening in Libya right now. You see? Now the people, the different philosophies around the world are in conflict. And no, no discussion. No uh, conception of other people's functioning. So maybe that's the message that we need to send to future generations that one day we'll, we'll be doing research on the Korean uh, War. I mean, it's not... Have, have, to get, have to get rid of all the isms. Uh -huh. Get rid of all the isms. And do dialogue and exchange and education. For instance, uh, I was down at a function at that East Genesee Street Korean church. And uh, I was talking to the guy's name was Joe Kim. Caster? Pastor Joe Kim. And he says, how do, you, how do you do something like that? I says, when your people come here from the old country, don't let them move within a quarter of a mile from anyone else from the old country. That way they got to at least walk a quarter of a mile to get over there. Yeah. They have to walk through the, you know, yeah. through the citizenry to get there. And eventually, the children will not, the grandchildren will not eat kimchi for supper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then it's also the same with, uh, with the people from the United States originally, yeah, you know, it's on us to learn about other cultures as well. Yep. Right? Yeah. But you see, we don't build rubber rafts out of old old tires and barrels to go to some other country. They do that to come here. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're going to come here, let them assimilate themselves into the culture. You know, don't join a mafia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't do drugs. Don't sell drugs. But we need to open our arms to them. Yes. Oh, yes, sure. By all means. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? They're here. That's right. I told my granddaughter, he says, you're going to marry uh, Pedro Gonzalez. Uh -huh. <laughs> she don't like that. Well, there's she, she doesn't like that. Yeah. Well, it's a reflection of how international the United States is now. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are an immigrant born country right. to start with yeah. and because of the Civil War it was exemplified mm -hmm. because all of the people that were killed in the Civil War practically were United States citizens mm -hmm. and they had to be replaced mm -hmm. so they let uh, immigrants come in they sent them out west they sent them all over and uh, they brought their cultures with them you know mm -hmm. For instance, the Italians brought pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone brought their own local cuisine. Um, well, I think, Mr. Reed, on that note, oh. I appreciate you sitting here with us. Uh, oh, thank you, Mark. It was very interesting to hear about all your stories. And as a token of our appreciation and the uh, Republic of Korea, they would like to present you with a medal that they have. <coughs> The Ministry of Patriot and Veterans Affairs, as well as the Korean Veterans Association of the Korean government, would like to present you with this peace medal. And I'm just going to hang this around your neck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. We appreciate your service and coming here to share your stories oh, with us. I'm very proud to do it. Well, I am proud of my service. Does not, may, may not sound like it, but I am proud of my service. So why is this important to you to participate? People should know about things like this. Know about why we went there, what we did when we were there, why we did what we did when we were there, and mainly what the results were on the culture that was already there when we got there. And everyone can see what we did in South Korea. 
They tell me there are no more thatched huts, no more in my rice paddies, super highways. Now, how can they put a super highway in a little place like Korea? <laughs> you drive 55 miles an hour, 65, 70, you're already crossing. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I went. When I got there, I said to my buddy, I said, what in the hell am I doing in a place like this? I don't have to be here, but I'm glad I went. Well, and I'm glad you went, and I'm sure many Koreans are glad you went as well. Well, and I'm going to tell you people what I tell all Koreans when I speak to them like we're doing now. When you write to the old folks, you got old folks over there? When you write to them, you tell them, John Reedy says, take good care of our country because I feel like it's my country too. I spent enough time there, was involved enough. <clears throat> Didn't see very many civilians at all, except uh, the, the KSCs. You ever you know what the KSCs were? Korean Service Corps? They patched up the roads and things like that. Very few of them, saw very few of them. And uh, of course the Katusa soldiers, some of them very good friends of mine. I don't know their names. I couldn't pronounce them if I did. <laughs> so. right. Well, thank you for sharing again. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And thank you for thank you for inviting me.